Okay, so how is everyone today? Good? Okay, so shh. So the first announcement is that what happened to the homework? <laughs> so uh, as you could probably tell, I got behind posting the homework. So th really, so what we're going to do <coughs> about that is we're going to make all those homeworks uh, due on not Thursday because that would be that would be too short of a turnaround. So we'll make them we'll make them due on Tuesday. We'll make them all due on Tuesday, and some of them would be for bonus, so that you know you could make your own choice about whether or not you're going to you're going to try and turn it in on time because there's going to be a whole bunch of them due Tuesday then. Yeah. So. But I'll, I'll take a look at it, the whole group, and make sure that it's within reason. Okay. <clears throat> Very good. So last time, what was the last thing we talked about last time? We were talking about uh, open, closed, and, and this kind of thing. So today is what, the 19th? Okay, so just as a brief review of, <clears throat> of what we said last time. An open set the, the concept, not the strict definition, but the concept. An open set is a set where you can take any point that's in there and do what with it? Yeah, you can put it inside of an open ball, and this open ball is, is entirely inside of the set. So, so that, that red point is contained within a, this open ball. It doesn't mean that, it, that every open ball has to fall in there. It just means that there has to be some open ball. This open ball could be uh, big. It could, it could be quite small. Okay. So what is a closed set? Close set is, yeah, I heard someone. Complement of an open set. So, complement of an open set. <clears throat> okay, what is the boundary of a set? <clears throat> What's the boundary of a set? Very good. So <clears throat> these are points which. So I'll draw. I'll draw part of the this edge bit here, dashed. So that's dashed. The boundary of a set. The boundary of a set is all the points where you can. Select a point, and it, it doesn't even need to be in the set. So for example, that red point is in the set. But this other red point on the dashed part is not in the set. However, they're both in the boundary of the set because observe that any ball, any ball you draw around, the, around that point is going to contain, contain points that are in the set and also points that are outside of the set. So the shaded ones are inside, the unshaded ones are outside. And it doesn't matter for that particular point how small you make the ball, you're always going to get points inside and outside. Similarly, this one is true for that one. <coughs> so that point is on the boundary of the set, but notice that this point is not even in the set itself. Okay, so you need not be in the set to be in the boundary. Okay, so what's the closure of a set? Yeah, you take the set itself and then you union in its boundary. So boundary, if this is set X, then how do you denote the boundary of X? The fancy, the fancy D partial symbol. 
So that's the boundary of x. So the closure is x union its boundary. So this is the closure. <clears throat> so here's something to think about. I'll just, I'll just bring it up and just to throw it out there to give you something to think about. Uh, boundary are all, remember, it's all the points that, that uh, cannot be separated from the interior or the exterior of the set with, a ball, with, uh, with any ball. So consider the rationals for a moment, the rational numbers. The, a subset of the reals that, that can be represented as the ratios of integers. Can someone give us a number that, that is real but not rational? Pi, Pi is an example. Uh, most of the numbers are, are not rational. And by most, I mean if you were had e equal probability of choosing any number at all in the reals, you could choose now until forever and you'll never pick a rational. Not ever. Okay, <clears throat> if you had equal probability of choosing any particular number. So what is the boundary of the rationals? Hmm, I'll just, I'll just throw it out there. So what's the boundary of the rationals? <coughs> Something to think about. What, what might that be? Okay, <clears throat> what is the interior? We got to this one, right? Yes. Yeah. So what's the interior? X is a null of X such that for every sigma being zero or one. I don't know how to read whatever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So an interior point, so in the first place is denoted with a circle hat. So it's X with a with a circle hat on. Point X is in the interior of X when there exists epsilon greater than zero such that the ball of radius epsilon centered at X is a subset of X. <coughs> so to be in the interior, to be in the interior conceptually means that you're in the set but not on the boundary of the set, more or less. So here's a set. Uh, this point right here, is it interior? It is interior. It's interior because you can put it inside of that ball, for example. And you could even fit it inside of, a, of, a, of an even bigger one. And lots of smaller ones. So how about, can you tell me a point that's not in the interior? Anything, <laughs> Anything on the boundary. <laughs> so how about, how about this one? So that point is in the set, because I, because I drew the set with a solid edge, so that, yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean to include that, po that point in the set. So that point is in the set, but it's not, not in the interior because it can't be, uh, you can't draw a ball around it and it fall entirely inside the set. Okay, good, any question about that? So open, close, boundary, closure, interior. Yes? Why don't we just say the set minus the boundary? Well, this, this is also a reasonable definition, but then you've got to prove that, that it's equivalent to this one. So I'll make that a homework exercise. Okay. Is the set, uh, what if the set doesn't include the boundary? Would it be the boundary You mean to say, you, you mean to say if the boundary is empty? Okay, so let, let's, let's ask a specific question. 
So what if we have set A contains the numbers 1, 2, and 3, and we have set B contains the numbers 3 and 7? Okay. So, I, so your question kind of comes down to this. What is, the, what is A subtract B? Or if you like, uh, if, if, it, if it bothers you, if your previous instructor wrote set subtraction with that, I'll write it in, my, in that way. So what, what is A subtract B? It's 1 and 2. Because to, to subtract one set, the right subtrahend, <laughs> silly word, this B, what you're doing is you're taking away all the things in A that are in B. So, so what you're saying is that what if a set doesn't have a boundary? Or, sorry, well, no, you're not even, you didn't say that. You said, what if we have an open set? Let, and let's be very specific. What if we have this open set, which is a ball? Then its boundary is exactly the solid bit. And then suppose you, suppose you subtract it away. Well, you'll be back with the original set. <coughs> You have you've got to show it. Yes. Uh, we consider all points inside the real screen interior points. You you mean interior to the reals? Interior to the reals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The the reason is because because for an open set every point is interior. So you take any you imagine your favorite open set and and imagine your favorite point in your favorite open set. That point's interior. Yes. Right. Degree minus a set of, the set of one, two, three minus a set of seven. We don't add in negative seven. It's just still one, two, three. Right. Like we don't change it. So you can still say it's the set minus the boundary because it just doesn't change it. We don't get like a negative boundary. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yes. What, what, what this is, what, a, a different way to pronounce this is I'm talking about the set that contains things in A that are not in B. Or, if you like, make a new set by copying A and deleting everything that happens to also B and B. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Good. So now, <clears throat> a definition of a sequence. Sequence on Rn. So a sequence on Rn is a function uh, is a function and to be in line with the book with signature in star to Rn and by n star I mean naturals which are positive. So depend, depending on who you're talking to, sometimes the naturals include zero and sometimes they don't. So when you're talking to me, they do. So when, when I'm talking, that is to say, I reckon zero to be a natural. Uh, but right now I'm talking about the first index is one. Is, this, uh, is a function uh, like that. Okay, so for example, <coughs> for example, we could have the sequence i maps to, say, uh, 1 over i and uh, i squared. So that's a sequence. And remember, the maps to operator is the way you make an anonymous function. So this is a function without a name. So what is, what is this function evaluated when i is 1? 1, 1, right? And then what is this function evaluated when i is 2? 1 half, one. One half 4. And then 1 third, 9, et cetera. OK? So this is just like the sequences that you know, except now they're stacked. So 
now we can have exercises instead of there being one sequence in play, now there can be n sequences in play. It, it's not all that um, <coughs> exciting or different. So, uh, definition. This is the definition of convergence. So a sequence A uh, I on Rn is said to converge to point A in Rn when so now we've got our crazy math definition for all epsilon greater than zero there exists a big M in the naturals such that little m let's write this on the next line otherwise I'm going to run out of horizontal space such that little m more than big M implies that the distance from a uh, m minus a is less than epsilon. Okay, <clears throat> so let's try and understand what this definition is. Now remember a sequence, a sequence is a function from the naturals to Rn. So in, as, a, as a conceptual matter, I'd like for you to imagine that a sequence is like a list of numbers that, that has infinitely many elements. There's a first one, a second one, a third one, a 2,451st one, right? All, all the way down the line. <clears throat> so what this definition is saying, it's saying if we have, if we have a point A, And that's the point that we allege that the sequence converges to. What that means is that the sequence can be doing any old thing. Like maybe here's, here's uh, you know, one of the points, another one, another one. It can be doing any kind of, any kind of thing it wants over here. To converge means to say that you take this point and you draw a circle around it, a ball, because remember we're in Rn of radius epsilon then whatever this sequence is doing you can only draw finitely many points outside of the circle that's what it's saying is that eventually you're going to enter the circle maybe you leave again maybe you come back into the circle there's going to come a point where you enter the circle and you never leave ever again. You can keep listing out all the, all the members of the sequence and you're going to be in the circle forever now. And you, can, you can be anywhere in there but you have to stay in the circle. Okay, so <clears throat> to converge means that is, is another way to say if you were to plot all the points of the sequence <coughs> Only finitely many, and, and if you draw a circle around the, the alleged limit point, only finitely many points are allowed to be outside. Infinitely many of them must be inside. And furthermore, there must come a point where what you, you enter the circle and never leave. And it doesn't matter how small the circle is. Okay, good. Any question about the, the definition of convergence? Yes? Well, it, epsilon is, is a positive real, and infinite is not a, not a real. So you could take epsilon to be a million. You could say, well, I want a big old circle of radius a million. Then if, if, this, if the sequence converges, then, then you, can, you can fit all but finitely many of the sequence points inside of that big old circle. 
But even if epsilon is really small, you can still do it. Other, so yes? <coughs> Big M, this is, this is, so what this is saying, <coughs> what this is saying is that you've got, you can imagine sequence values like this is, this is sequence value one, <coughs> sequence value two, sequence value three, dot, 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 sequence value 2451, dot, 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 and then sequence value M. Sequence value M. These ones, these ones can fall outside the circle. And then from here forward, all of these must be inside the circle. So what, what big M is, is it's the, it's the cutoff point, is to say, now, from, for the sequence values from here forward, will all fall in the, in the ball. These might be outside or inside, but surely from here, they're inside. Yes? Infinite, infinitely many points, and only finitely many of them are allowed to be outside of any ball around the limit point for, for, for to say that it converges. So to be clear, uh, let's have an example of a sequence which doesn't converge, for example. So how about that same one that we talked about? So i goes to 1 over n, uh, 1 over i and then I squared. <coughs> okay, so, so this is not going to converge to anything. So in particular, to be specific, this will not converge <laughs> to say, uh, how about zero, zero. <laughs> not even zero, zero. Well, okay, zero, zero. It won't converge to the origin. So let's, let's see why not. Why would it not converge to the origin? <clears throat> well, let's, let's plot some values. Let's, let's plot where they, where they end up falling. So uh, one over i, so at one, we have the point one, one. When you, when, at sequence value 2, you have the point uh, 1 fourth, uh, sorry, 1 half and 4. So that'd be half and 4. <coughs> Not necessarily to scale. Okay, then sequence value 3 would be uh, 1 third and 9. So that'd be like way up here. And do you observe that, it, this is not continuous, these are discrete points. But do you observe, if we were to keep drawing, then it would keep going up. It would keep going up. So let's look at the origin. That red point I just selected. And let's draw a big ball around it. So I'll even include that, that one that's way up there. Imagine that I got it right in the middle. <laughs> The trick, to drawing a circ the trick to drawing a circle is you draw the circle first, then you draw the point in the middle. You can't do it the other way around. Okay, imagine that it's perfect. Okay, so are, are infinitely, are all but finitely many of the points going to fall in here? No, right? They're going to zoom way off. They're going to zoom way off up there, and they're, they're all going to be way up, way up high. So this, this doesn't converge. This doesn't converge. How about... Uh, as a different example, how about I maps to uh, 1 over I? So you should be able to tell me from your prior experience, what, what will what, just, this, just this one coordinate, 1 over I, what will it converge to? And it's going to converge to 0, right? Because as I gets big, 1 over I gets small.
Okay, so how about, how about, um, how about that? And then sine of 1 over i, and then divided by 1 over i. So that is to say that this is a function with two coordinates, a sequence with two coordinates. Its first coordinate is 1 over, n, uh, 1 over i. Except its second coordinate is this one. So does anyone know the name of, of the function that, that takes an x and makes sine x divide by x? It has its own name. This is true and when x is infinite, but where is its argument 1 over i going? To 0, right? So this, this is going to be like the limit as x goes to 0 of sine x over x, which is what? One. Which is 1. And what is the name for the function sine x over x? Sync. sync. The sync function, S-I-N-C. OK. <clears throat> OK. So this, this is going to converge. to the point 0, 1. This will converge to the point 0, 1 because, conceptually anyway, <coughs> 0, 1 is right there. And you can select a ball of any radius that you like. And here I did it again. I drew the point first, and now I'm drawing the circle. OK, so <clears throat> 0, 1. Where is the, uh, where is the first point? <laughs> that would require me to know what the sine of 1 is. Do we have a calculator? Well, not, yeah, but not for. The sine of 1? No, I don't think so. The sine of 1, this, is some value that no one should, in their right mind should know. <laughs> OK, so it's, it's close to 0. Am I in degrees? No, I'm in degrees. Uh, radians. OK, so this is the value. So it's about 0 0.8. Okay, sine of, sine of 1. So this would be, uh, so the x coordinate would be 1, and then the y coordinate, the second coordinate would be here. So we're, we're outside. We're outside of the, that ball. What would the next one be? So uh, the x coordinate, the, the first coordinate would be half, would be half, so we'd go closer that way. And then the, the y coordinate would be, 2 times the sine of 2. Uh, 2 times the sine of half. Oh my goodness, I'm having difficulty here. 2 sine of half. <clears throat> okay, so that's, that's getting closer to 1. So we'd, about, we'd be about right here. Okay, so now... What I want you to understand is that I've plotted two points. I've plotted two points, and if we were to uh, Gesundheit, if we were to continue plotting points, they could they could go anywhere, uh, anywhere at all. But eventually, where must they all start falling? In the circle. There's going to come a point where we just can't get away. Okay, good. So if you were to make the if you were Gesundheit, if you were to make the circle really small really, really small, then you could arrange it so that trillions and trillions of points are outside for, for, for small enough of a circle. There could be trillions of points outside, but all the rest of them in their infinite multitude must be inside. Question? Um, so can we say that a set is convergent if its elements are convergent as well? A sequence. A sequence, sorry. I don't understand your question. So, 
the reason we're able to do this because both the elements, I say elements in the sequence, uh, are both converted. One over i will converge to zero, and uh, sine of one over i over one over i converges to one. OK, now I understand your question. Did you have a question? No. Sequence start with the natural. Good. Very good. Remember, a sequence is a function from the nat from the from the positive naturals to the to R n. Okay. So uh, now now I lost my train of thought. Sequence. Sequence. Ah, yeah. Okay, that one is that. Uh, here's a proposition, <clears throat> is that a sequence, sequence on Rn converges exactly when, that means if and only if, its coordinate functions, or just its coordinates, converge. So rather than give you, uh, give you an example where I'm trying to do n coordinates at the same time and I have to use double indices, I'll just do it with two, with two coordinates in R2. And I think it should be clear. So that is to say that if we have the sequence i maps to the first coordinate I'll call ai and the second coordinate bi, so this converges, this converges uh, if and only if, so this statement, if and only if, I to AI converges. Is that me? No. It's my same ringer. <laughs> if and only if this one converges and this one converges. So if we had if we had uh, a sequence on say R fifty there'd be 50 different coordinate functions. In order for the sequence to converge in R50, each one of the individual coordinate functions must converge in the reals. Okay, so, so there, those, are, uh, those conditions are identical. Okay, so that's a proposition, but we're gonna leave it unproved because we're doing so much, uh, so much talking. <laughs> okay, good. <clears throat> Any question about uh, limits of sequences. So we're not really so interested in limits of sequences, uh, primarily for for our purposes. Rather, we're going to be uh, interested in functions and limits of functions. <coughs> okay. So definition. This is limit of a function. So that is to say a function from R n to R m. <coughs> so let x be a subset of R n. Let x point x be in the closure of x. So again, can someone put that in x being in the closure of x? That means what now? Yeah. It means that we're either, you, you can think of it like we're either inside the set or right on the edge. Now, does, does point x need to, need to be in set x? 
No, not necessarily, right? Because you could imagine, say, the open disk, or even easier, the open unit interval. What points, what points are in the boundary of the open unit interval that are not in the open unit interval? Zero and one. Okay. So let x be a, a subset. Let x be in the closure of that set. And let f be a function from x to rm. Ah, and I'm going to rename this point to x not. So that little red bit is what wasn't there before. Then the statement limit as x goes to x naught of function f of x equal to point A. OK, so by the way, where must, what, where must A sit? What, what is A sitting inside of? It's, what kind of thing is it? It's got to be, is, it, is A sitting inside of our N? No, it's sitting inside of our M, right? So we could be talking about a function that takes R3 to R8. A is sitting inside of R8. OK, so this statement means, means uh, for all epsilon greater than 0, there exists a delta greater than 0 such that for all x in set x, the distance from x to x naught less than delta implies the distance from f of x to a less than epsilon. OK, now, I want to point out something that's a, that's a bit of a surprise. It may be surprising for, for your previous experience. What, th this is not exactly the same as the, the limit that you knew previously, and not, not just because we're using vectors. OK, so this red bit that I'm writing is the part that is usually present. So that red bit is usually there in the definition. But it's not present in the definition in the book. So some of the little bits of intuition that you might be accustomed to about limits, little corner cases, might be a little bit off. So if, this, if, if we include this red, wh what is the distinction between including the red and not including the red? Yeah, the only distinction is whether or not you're allowing x to be equal to x naught. That's the only distinction. If, if, uh, you, if the red is not there, then it is permissible for x to be equal to x naught. Okay, that, that's allowable. Whereas, uh, whereas if it is there, it's, it's not permissible. Okay, so we're going to, that particular aspect is not going to come up too much, so I'm not going to stress it too hard. But with the red, this means, this me you can interpret this to mean close to but not equal to x naught. When the red is absent, it means close to and even possibly equal to x naught. Okay. Absence of red bit is what makes it different from the definition of limit? What I, what I mean to say is that calculus, as it's taught frequently in the United States and including at this university, the, the 2417 usually includes the red. No, that, that's not true. It, it, in the definition that you're accustomed to, it does mean that, if the red is there. If the, if the red is absent, then it is permissible for x to be x naught. Even for limits. Even for limits. Uh, as long as x naught happens to be in the set. If it's on the boundary, then you, then you can't get there anyhow. OK, yes? So we can't do it yet. So like certain cancellations you can do, knowing that it will be equal to Right. <laughs> so there's going to be all kinds. Yes? Um, okay. For the assumptions, so let, 
Now x naught is in x closed. Yes. But then for the, it means that for every x, x which might not be stopped with time. So. Right. Oh, because. So if, if x is a closed set, or sorry, if, if, if x is, if, if x naught is on the boundary and, and x naught is not in, is not in the set, x naught is not in the set, uh, then, then this is the same as what you're used to. Anyhow, we've got to, we've got to keep going. Okay, so we've got, uh, we've got functions it, that's more or less more or less the same definition uh, that you're accustomed to. Let's make sure that we understand what it's saying. What it's saying is this, is that if this is Rn over here, this is Rn and here is Rm where you're going. So I'm going to draw two copies of this so that you can see before and after. Okay, so the way that you get from place to place is with F. So we've got two points at play. We've got uh, X naught is here. And here it is again because this is a copy. So X naught is some point in the in the, the closure of x. So this might not even be in x. It might just be in its closure. Then we've got a point over here, point A, which is the limit point. What, what the definition is saying, it's, it's an adversarial game. It's saying that this is the game board. And we have two copies of the board because I want to show you before and after. We, for you to say that the limit exists is to say that I'm allowed to challenge you in the following way. I can say, well, if the limit exists, if the limit exists, then can you get this close to A? Is it possible to get this close? So this is me saying, okay, it's my challenge to you. I produce a ball of radius epsilon in the in the range. So this is, this is my move. <laughs> so produce a ball of radius epsilon here. And then depend, it may be the case that if you're far away from x, if you're far away from x, like that, may, I'm construing that as being far, maybe f takes it to right here, which is not in the ball. Okay, so then that point doesn't make it into the ball, but maybe a really close point uh, will make it into the ball. So the question is, the challenge is, I produce, I produce the epsilon in the range. Your, what you must do is you must produce what? Delta. You must produce the delta, and where must it reside? In the domain. In the domain, and it has to be the case. So I've, this is just a copy of that one. You say, well, I respond in the following way. Here's my delta. And then what's going to be true about this ball? Yes, all points in this ball will be sent to that ball. If you're in here, you will land in there. You can't land anywhere else. If you select a point outside of, the, of here, you might, you might not land in there. But surely, surely, you have no choice. If you start here, you must end there. This is the, the epsilon delta definition. Okay, in, in pictures. 
Okay, any question about this? Any question about it? Okay, so then, so some of the, some of the interesting things occur when the uh, limit doesn't exist. So in particular, the same facts, this is really a proposition from your prior experience, still hold, and that is that limits are unique. So I don't really need to say much more than just the title of that proposition. If there's a limit, there can be just one. Okay, if it exists, then it, then it is unique. <clears throat> okay, so let's, let's, consider, uh, let's consider a function where this gets all, all messed up. So now we finally have a concrete example we've been talking abstractly for a while. So consider the function f, which is from the plane minus the origin to, uh, to the reals. So all that I mean is that we're going to plug in x's and y's, but we can't, and one of them can be zero or the other, but not both. Uh, we'll consider this uh, by the following formula that f of x and y is defined in cases uh, in the following way, that it is, it is the expression absolute value y exponential uh, of negative y absolute over x uh, squared. So it's, it's this when x is not zero, and otherwise it is zero <coughs> when x is zero and y isn't. Okay. So let's let's take a quick look at at the domain. What does the domain look like? So what's the domain look like? It, it's, it's all the points, right, except the, except the origin. Okay, so, so uh, the domain, I don't know a good way to draw it like this. So it's everything except that one point at the origin. Okay, so what's the boundary of the domain? The origin, right? So the domain of, of, of this set has just one point in it. It's, it's the origin. It's not in the set, but it's in the boundary of the set, which means that according to our definitions, even though the origin is not in the set, it is perfectly legitimate for us to ask about the limit of the function at that point because it's on the boundary. So my question is, let's compute, let's consider The limit as x and y go to 0 of f of x and y. Okay. So in particular, the way we're going to the way we're going to consider this is let's approach along, uh, let's approach along, what would be a good way, along a line. Y is mx. So what does y is mx look like when you draw it? A line, and in particular it's going to the origin. So this is y is mx. So 
what we're going to do is we're going to reduce the number of variables from 2 to 1 by doing what? Yeah, by doing the substitution. We're going to replace all the y's with x's. Oh, sorry, with, m, with mx's. Okay. Then in that case, the limit becomes, uh, the limit becomes, the limit as x goes to 0. And since uh, we're doing y is mx, uh, and we're only interested in when y, we're not interested in the case m is 0, so let's, Let's specify that m is not 0, because that wouldn't be interesting. <coughs> uh, then we need to compute the limit of that expression where we've substituted y with mx. So that would be absolute mx and then exponential of negative mx absolute over x squared. Okay, what do you think? What can we do? Right. So all all the things all the things about scalar calculus limits that you knew before are are in play. So yes, even L'Hopital's is in play. So what would be the limit of this? Zero. Zero. And then, uh, well, this one, because, because uh, this x is like x to 1, and this is like x to 2, the one on the, in the denominator is going to win. So what is, what is this thing going to? And, well x is going to 0, so what's that going to? Something infinite, an infinite amount, right? In fact, negative infinite, right? Because the numerator is negative, if that negative is up there, and the denominator is positive. Okay? So negative infinite, uh, that means what? So this is going to negative infinite, so what's exponential of negative? What does exponential do as its argument goes to negative infinite? Zero. So this one's going to zero, right? And that one's going to zero. So do we need, do we need L'Hopital's to do this? No, not really, right? So what is the limit it, in this case? It's zero, because it would be the absolute value of zero and then multiplied by zero. So this is zero. OK. So it might seem like. It might seem like uh, the limit should be zero. However, however, now let's approach. Along a different path. So in particular, we'll do say y is m x squared, and we'll again require that m is not 0, because otherwise <coughs> it wouldn't be interesting. So now, what does parabola look like? If, if m happens to be positive, then it would look something like this. OK. So this might be a bit surprising when we do this. So what do you suspect? Is the limit going to exist? And if so, what is it going to be? It seems like the limit should be 0, right? Because no matter what line, no matter what line you approach along, the limit is 0. If you head straight to the origin, the limit is 0. What happens if you travel along a, par a parabola? OK, so again, we're eliminating one variable. And now we're replacing all of the y's with mx squared. So now this is mx squared, and then exponential of negative absolute mx squared, and then over x squared. Uh, 
Okay. Now what? Wait a second. Am I missing something? Ugh. I copied the function down wrong. That's distressing. So now all that stuff I just said is... Ugh. This should be over x squared. I'm so sorry for this. Okay, now let's consider this again. <laughs> Something was going too, too wrong too fast. Okay, so this should be over x squared. Ah, now we have a problem. I knew something was off when, when the first one was too easy. Okay, so let's, let's not scratch this out so it's too ugly because we need to keep it for posterity. So, but no. <laughs> so we're doing this limit now. Let's consider again. So the numerator is zero. We went through that pretty easy, but the denominator is also going to zero, right? Okay, so now we have a problem. So how can, now how can we fix this? L'Hopital's. <clears throat> what time is it? Oh my goodness. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, what do you think? How are we gonna do it? Specifically for this limit. What can we do? Well, let's simplify a little bit. So the limit as x goes to 0 of, uh, well, x squared x squared is, uh, can be factored in and out of absolute value because it, it can never be negative. So I'll, I'll distribute the x squared into this and write, write it, the product in this way. So this would be absolute mx over x squared. So taking this x squared with that one. And then similarly, the exponential uh, could be written in this way, negative absolute mx over x squared. Okay, then we can cancel the x's to obtain the limit as x goes to 0, m over x, exponential, negative, absolute, m over x. Okay, now what's the story? <clears throat> so perhaps it'll help if I write one more. So this will be the limit as x goes to zero of the quotient now. So uh, m over x in the numerator. and then divided by the exponential of absolute m over x. Okay, so now let's think about this and use our prior calculus knowledge. So m over x, because m is non-zero, m over x is going to become infinite in size as x goes to zero. And in particular, it'll be positive infinite because it's inside of absolute value. Similarly, this is the exact same thing. So we've got We've got the red box is becoming infinite, and then we've got ex exponential of red box. So which one, numerator or, numerator or denominator, will become infinite faster? The denominator. And not a little bit faster, but a lot, because it's exponential of, of that thing. So what is the limit? Still zero. Still zero. Not all is lost. <laughs> So now let's try to approach along a parabola. Okay, 
so now it would be the limit as x goes to zero, and now we're going to substitute that with uh, absolute mx squared exponential of negative absolute mx squared over x squared and then all of that over x squared. So now using the same trick as before, that is to say that x squares can be fact factored inside of absolute values because they can only be non-negative, now what will the cancellation be? So supposing we combine these, we get absolute value of m, right? absolute value of m, and then it will be multiplied by exponential of negative absolute value of m, which is what's the limit? That number, right? Whatever that happens to be. So it's absolute value of m divided by exponential of absolute value of m, which in particular is not zero, right? It's not zero. If you, were to, if you were to select m is 1, then this would be 1 over e. So that, so that means that if you approach along a line, the limit will be zero. If you head straight to the origin, your limit is zero. But if you sort of glance by the origin following a parabola, then <laughs> a parabola with, with leading coefficient m, then you're going to get this. So somehow you won't hit, you won't hit zero. That's interesting. So does the limit exist? It doesn't. The limit doesn't exist because if, if limits exist, they must be unique. Interesting. So this depends on M. And therefore, uh, the limit doesn't exist. Interesting. Yes? What does it mean to approach along a line? So you could construe it in the following way. You could say, uh, in this particular case, we said that we would approach uh, along a line going through here. And what it means is you could take the sequence, say uh, i maps to 1 over, uh, if that's exactly the line y is x, we could say 1 over, in, 1 over i, 1 over i. So this sequence, 1 over i, 1 over i, does what? So the first point would be up here at 1, 1. And then the second point would be at half half. And then the third point at one third one third. And the fourth point at one fourth one fourth. And then you can see that these points are going to go to the to the limit point at zero. So you could think of it like we're making a function, we're making a new sequence by by evaluating the function at these sequence points. And then asking whether or not that sequence exists. So that's what it means to approach along a line. Yes? Do we have that the limit doesn't exist because really we have like a two-dimensional, I don't know, domain mapping onto another dimension? So we have like, if we, we could visualize it as like a three-dimensional graph and we wouldn't have like a hill or something where that would be our limit in three dimensions? I don't know if, that's, if that makes any sense what I'm trying to say. Like, we wouldn't have a three-dimensional limit like we might have lines that have like a hill around them on that line, but if we come to it from a different dimension, we wouldn't have the same thing. I'm not really sure what you're saying, but like I'll give some. R two to R, but if we put those all on the same thing, like a three-dimensional point instead of a two-dimensional point and a one-dimensional point, if we just mapped it all out as three-dimensional points, then would we see like a visually we could see that it doesn't have like a, a hill in three dimensions. It might have like a long kind of valley or something, but it doesn't have a singular three dimension. I don't know if that still is making any sense. I 
I tell you what, let's talk about it after class. Okay, yeah, sorry, I don't want to waste any more it's, it's, not, it's not my time. <laughs> it's everyone's time. Okay, good. So, uh, the, same, the same kind of things that you knew before about, about limits exist. So all the stuff, like if you have two functions and they each have a limit, then you can compute the limit of the sum and the limit of the sum is the sum of the limits. Okay, and if you have two, and, and of course I mean at the same point. So if you have two functions that have uh, a limit at uh, a point, then you can combine them in a variety of ways. Adding them, if one of them is a scalar valued function, then you can, then you can multiply them together. Why do I have to say if one of them is a scalar value function? Well, if they're both vectors, what do you mean by multiply? This is the problem, okay? So if one of them is a scalar value and the other one also a scalar or a vector, then you can compute their product, their product makes sense, and the limit of the product is the product of the limits, etc. Okay. <coughs> Definition. Continuity. So uh, let x be a subset of Rn, let x, point, point x be in set x, uh, point x not be in set x, and let f be from Rn to, uh, sorry, from x to Rm. So this definition starts out just like the definition for limit with one, uh, with one modification. What's the modification? It's not in the closure, right? It, which is to say, it, I'm not saying it's in the closure. I'm saying it's, it's actually in the set. Okay, it may also be in the closure. <laughs> it, it, it must therefore also be in the closure, right? So, so the statement F is continuous at that point. So now that's a statement. Means that the limit as x goes to x naught of f of x is what? f of x naught. So that means, what that means, continuity means, is that computing the limit of a function at a point is the same thing as evaluating at that point. That's what continuity means. Uh, now, it's not usually written this way, but I like to point this out to math majors, and that is that this statement could be rewritten in this way And it would look weird, but be just as true. So what's the limit of x as x goes to x naught? x naught. So this, this thing I wrote in there is just a strange way to write x naught. But the reason to write it this way is, is to bring out what it means to be continuous. <coughs> It means that function evaluation commutes with computing limits. You can, either, you can either compute limits first or evaluate. So the f can be taken inside and outside the limit like that. Okay, that's what continuity means. <coughs> um, all, the, all the things that you know about uh, continuity is, are still true, including things like what's an exa some examples of continuous functions. Uh, polynomials, right? They're, they're the best kind. Okay, what's another very rich kind? Exponentials and their very closely related cousins, the trigonometric functions. These are all continuous. 
Okay, so, so uh, because those functions are continuous, it will also turn out to be true that if we have, if we have a function, say, from R2 to R3, then there will be three coordinate functions, one for the first coordinate, one for the second, and one for the third. Continuity will be exactly when all three coordinate functions are continuous. So the vector valued function is continuous exactly when each one of its components are continuous. Okay, so now I have a question for you. Let's consider this function. Uh, f of x is one over x. So function that you've known for since you were a wee, a wee child in Miss Harris's class. What's the, what's the natural domain of, of, of this function? So the natural domain is what? Yeah, everything, everything but zero. And if we plot it, then how does it look? Like so, right? So it does this, and it does this. OK. So I have a question for you. Ah, the other thing is that a function is said to be continuous on a set if it's continuous at every point uh, in that set. So I have a question. Is, is f a continuous function? Is f a continuous function? Yes. Yes. Right. So th those of you who are wondering, who are saying, I don't know, I'm feeling uncomfortable about this. Is f continuous? Yes, it's continuous. What aspect of the definition is, is, is in play here? Yeah. So... So it doesn't even make sense to ask whether or not the function is continuous at zero because it's not even, it's not even a point. So you can't even, you, it doesn't even make sense. The question is wrong to ask whether or not it's continuous at zero. So it's just like saying, I could say, how do you like this red apple that I have here? What's your, object what's your objection? It's clearly red. <laughs> It's not an apple in the first place, right? So, so it, this function is continuous. It's not connected, but it is continuous. Okay, good. We'll finish. We'll, we'll do more next time.